Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. Four months ago, Governor Andrew Cuomo was interviewed behind closed doors for 11 hours on the multiple claims of sexual harassment made against him this year. And now we finally know what he said. Hundreds of pages of transcripts were released this week from the Attorney General's office, which led the investigation into those claims. And there is just a lot to get through here, so let's jump right into it. With me in studio are John Campbell from the USA Today Network and Kate Lisa from Johnson Newspapers. Glad to have you both, as always. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. So this was, I couldn't tell you the page count of all of them together. It was transcripts of Cuomo's testimony. Um, not all of the women who accused him, but a good chunk and probably the most high profile ones. Um, so a lot of ground to cover. I just want to ask you guys first, Kate, what was your takeaway here? What, what stood out to you? So definitely, yeah, it was thousands of pages. I mean, it was um, a tremendous release. And so we did, we learned details that um, were shocking in some ways and in others, they were kind of what we had known. We saw that Cuomo really doubled down with his his tactic of deny, deny, deny. And he, with, um, with private attorney and who was leading the, um, the questioning, June Kim, uh, the investigator, he was really um, sparring back and forth with him a little bit, picking apart words. It was know. tense. It, it was tense and um, clearly on the defensive on, on some things, nitpicking about what things like girlfriend meant. In one breath, he would, uh, the former governor, would assert his, his experience as an attorney and, and like flex his legal jargon. And then in the other, um, right, he was doing that. And But uh, I think one of the biggest takeaways that, that really shocked me was when he was talking about one of his former um, or top aides, Stephanie Benton, talking about how she would sign things for him. And, and revealing that he had lied to reporters in May of this year, that he had taken the sexual harassment, or completed the sexual harassment training. He right. said that he had completed it this year in 2021, and to Mr. Kim, said that he only completed it in 2019, and that Stephanie Benton may have auto-signed the attestation that he completed it, and that also she might have signed legislation, executive orders, other documents for him in the past. So it was it was really talk about a bombshell. Yeah, the whole thing about the bill, the the signing part of it, about Stephanie Benton signing bills for him, maybe signing executive orders, things like that, really took me by surprise. But then I had to think about it and maybe it's not that uncharacteristic. I have no idea what previous governors did. Uh, but that was something that really stood out to me as well. John, how about you? What what were your big takeaways here? Well, a, a couple things. I mean, we, we not only learned about more about the sexual harassment complaints and, and accusations, we also learned about some of the toxic culture accusations within the governor's office. I mean, there was a, a uh, very pins and needles atmosphere. The state trooper who alleges she was harassed by the governor went into detail about uh, how, you know, the governor gets what he wants and, and, you know, how he had to show up and the elevator had to be waiting for him while, um, you know, there were other detailing details of, you know, screaming behind closed doors, both by the governor and top members of his staff. And also we heard from uh, the, the medical doctor who administered the governor's uh, nasal swab for a COVID test on, on live TV. Uh, you know, she spoke about the morale within the Department of Health during the pandemic. Uh, and it was it was quite shocking. I mean, we knew some of this. There was a mass exodus of, of staffers, but she was also told that they were not allowed to collaborate with local departments of health, with the New York City Department of Health, which was, yeah. uh, well, I, I believe she said the Department of Mental Health at the time where the pandemic was uh, was raging in New York City. And, you know, we knew that Andrew Cuomo and Bill de Blasio had a, a poor working relationship. I'm not sure we quite knew that it went to that level. And how did that affect the pandemic? It was my question in reading that was, if they weren't allowed to really work with these local agencies, then was the coordination really there in a way that really ha uh, would create a robust response to this virus that has killed so many people? So. And clearly not, too, because, you know, they didn't, um, they, they even said that some protocols they found out at press conferences, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So yeah, I don't know how you do that. Or, you know, why wouldn't you have, um, for, for public safety or, or health, if that's the goal, how is that the safest practice? I don't understand. Yeah, I didn't really either. And, and that whole thing is just a, another can of worms. I do want to get to, like, some of the specifics about some of the women that testified as part of this investigation. Um, first, I'll go through Brittany Camisso, just 
take a few minutes on this. So I, I found it interesting, part of this, the investigators were asking Brittany Camissa what she was wearing when she went into the mansion where she was allegedly groped by the governor. And at first I was reading that and I was like, oh, this is kind of rude, asking her what she was wearing, kind of like a victim blaming type of thing. And then I realized maybe it's like an identification type of thing, because as we know, with uh, Sheriff Apple's misdemeanor complaint, they used state police aerial footage, which is so interesting to me. <laughs> so that was a takeaway for me. Um, the governor, of course, said in his testimony that he definitely did not touch Brittany Camisso. He didn't touch anybody inappropriately is what he said. Brittany Camisso has testified as well that the governor used to say inappropriate remarks to her. Like it, at one point, he commented to her she was uh, wearing a dress, I believe, or wearing pants, and he said something along the lines of, uh, show some leg or good to see you showing some leg. So that was just an interesting part to me. Um, the toxic culture, though, John, I want to go back to that with you. So Charlotte Bennett testified about this, uh, and I think the other women did testify about this as well. But there's this culture they testified in on the second floor when they were there that really um, stoked the flames of this behavior. Can you describe what we're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. And and the culture essentially, you know, the governor was in office for for ten years by the by this point, and. You know, there was a, a widespread culture of fear. There was a widespread culture of, of being fearful of angering the governor, angering his top staff. Uh, there, was, there was talk about the women that he, he, you know, was known, that the governor was known to prefer blondes. We heard from uh, women like Anna Liss, who was a, a former aide to the governor, that, you know, she was moved from one side of the building to the other side of the building, and, you know, she suspected you know, it might be because of her looks or because of her, her uh, you know, how she appeared rather than her performance. And that bothered a lot of people. And you hear a lot from uh, the women in these, in these statements about how they, they felt belittled or they felt they were fearful of the, the uh, a group of aides that had become known as the mean girls. And, yes. you know, and, and you hear, you get a better sense reading these transcripts about why that bothered uh, these women so much and why uh, they felt, you know, professionally looked down upon because of it. Yeah, and the Mean Girls thing, the investigators asked the women and I believe the governor whether they had ter heard the term Mean Girls as a reference. And I just want to point out that is like a public thing. During the 2018 campaign, Melissa DeRosa and the governor's top aides did frequently refer to themselves as the Mean Girls on Twitter. So <laughs> it's not something that was made up. Um, I just have to wonder how this all played into their work there and the environment there. Um, Kate, 30 seconds for you. We have the assembly maybe wrapping up its report. Do we know anything else at this point? I don't, but <laughs> tell me. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I think that's going to be the biggest thing going into next week, right? Um, we're going to be waiting to see, they're, they're going to, the members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee that were overseeing that impeachment probe earlier this year um, were, are going to review this report of what they found. So I think that will tell us even more going into next week and, and we'll have, um, I guess, even more one way or the other about where things are going. I'm on the edge of my seat. In my mind, right now, I'm not on the edge of my seat, <laughs> but metaphorically, I am. We'll leave it there. John Campbell from the USA Today Network and Kate Lisa from Johnson Newspapers. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.